Welcome to another episode of Game Music Minutia, and our further delving into Silent Hill 2. Alright, we're going to combine a great deal of what we've learned before, so if you haven't caught up yet, please do your homework. Links are even on the screen to help you out. Last video we talked about the concept of reality, and how it pulls us in with attraction and repulsion. We cited Theme of Laura as the song that encapsulates this idea. It not only contains that attractive melody mixed with Yamaoka's uses of texture, but it also kicks off the experience of the game. Playing over the opening cinematic, this is the first introduction to all of the characters and their experiences within Silent Hill. On this episode, we're going to delve into each of the characters James interacts with while searching for Mary. While Silent Hill 2 is known for its deep characterization and overall study of James, I think the additional characters are just as, if not more important. Of course, we're going to relate this to the music that represents them and how the different tracks create narrative arcs for each person. Let's begin with the most innocent in the bunch, the one who manages to visit Silent Hill without being touched by its dark powers, Laura. We first meet the young girl in the Blue Creek Apartments, where she kicks an important key away from James. Lovely little girl, isn't she? There's no music here, but this is important to note. Sound choice doesn't only relate to actual noise. Silence is a choice that can affect how a scene is perceived by the player. We've learned so far, metallic sounds tend to usher feelings of dread and notify the player of danger, while melody expresses safety. Well, Laura's first introduction doesn't have either, and that's okay, because Laura represents reality. As players know, Laura does not come across the monsters or figments of James's imagination in the game, so silence is a great notifier that we are in an environment that is, for now, untouched by darkness. We can talk about this later. This is no place for a kid. There are all sorts of strange things around here. I can't believe you haven't even gotten a scratch on you. Why should I? I mean... Our personal daily lives are mostly filled with silence. We don't have the theme songs that play over us constantly, unless we're living in our heads. So there's that. But let's get to what really matters. Shouldn't the song played over the opening scene be called Theme of James instead? He is our main character, after all. This is where Laura's theme being the title track starts to get interesting. If she is our beacon for reality, then her theme can act in a similar way. This music encapsulates the game as a whole, channeling the truths and realities of what the player will experience in the game. Melancholy and discovering truth is the reality of the game. We talked about its feeling of melancholy, and just like the different notes in the song, there are darker and lighter moments within that spectrum. Notes change, they go up and they go down. In this way, Laura becomes bigger than herself, making her character not only our tie to reality, but the game's overall atmosphere. We see this narratively through James's several interactions with her as she forces him to realize the truth, the reality of the things that he's done. Let's look at a specific example. In the hotel, James watches the videotape of Mary before she was bedridden, and by the end, he remembers the act of killing her. The song, True, begins to play, and Laura enters to see if James knows more about Mary's whereabouts. Mary. This is where he confesses killing Mary, but Laura makes sure to ask, she died because she was sick? James has to literally explain he killed her and why. Now, that song, True, 
has a very dark melody that conjures feelings of sadness, which is appropriate for the scene, but the title itself is what's important. Here James is addressing the true nature of his relationship with Mary, and Laura being the one to push him into the absolute truth is no coincidence. We need to discuss further the attraction and repulsion, and how the developers put it into overdrive with Eddie. When jumping down another epic hole in the ground, I mean there's a lot in this game, James comes across Eddie again, but this time, he's caught him in a compromising position. Holding a gun in his hand, Eddie dribbles on about his reasons for killing, none of which truly warrant justification Killing for the crime. Person ain't no big deal. Just put the gun to their head, pow. You, you killed him? But, but, but it wasn't my fault. He, he made me do it. Calm down, Eddie. Tell me what happened. That guy, he, he had it coming. I didn't do anything. He just came after me. Besides, he was making fun of me with his eyes, like that other one. Just for that, you killed him? What do you mean, just for that? Eddie, you can't just kill someone because of the way they looked at you. Apart from the chilling scene of seeing him stare blankly while sitting next to a body with its head blown off, the score is a very persistent metal sound, almost like someone dragging a barrel across the ground. This same style of music is played when James meets Eddie in the very end of the labyrinth section. However, doing? there's an added effect that really stands out. Wind chimes. You always busted my balls. You fat, disgusting piece of shit. You make me sick. Fat ass, you're nothing but a waste of skin. You're so ugly, even your mama don't love you. Well, maybe he was right. Maybe I am nothing but a fat, disgusting piece of shit. But you know what? It doesn't matter if you're smart, dumb, ugly, pretty. It's all the same once you're dead. And the corpse can't laugh. From now on, if anyone makes fun of me, I'll kill him. Just like that. Eddie. This is a wonderful depiction of attraction and repulsion flipped on its freaking head. The metal sounds have already warned us, of course alongside Eddie's threat to murder us, but that delicate and sweet chime is so out of place it's terrifying. Truly, it has always chilled me to the bone. If we break it down we can see why. See, we've noted danger is personified through music as metal sounds and off-kilter beats, our repulsion if you will, whereas safety is sweet melodies and silence, our attraction. So, how do we handle something like this? That low hum accenting Eddie's terrifying rant about the people he's murdered and wanted to kill? Then, a sweet wind chime. Why? Well, let's apply our formula here. If something safe is heard here, there's only one thing it can mean. Eddie believes his own madness. Remember, this is Eddie's arc here, and these are the sounds and the music that will affect him. It's important this plays right after Eddie's speech and right before James asks if Eddie is crazy. It's a musical cue to say, this person is gone. We've just learned that through his actions and his sayings, but the music accompanies that. That simple chime turns into something chilling, a sweet melodic sound that has been twisted and warped by someone evil. Killing is fun for them. Killing is what makes them feel safe. Isn't that a blast, guys? Now, let's talk about our dual characters, Mary and Maria, and how their themes are the epitome of attraction and repulsion. As most players of the game know, Team Silent made sure to give Mary and Maria the same facial structure. That way James and the players would be confused whenever they talked. While Maria isn't real, she does represent the sexual and nurturing side of Mary that James desires most. Mary is the opposite, taking on a more wholesome and lasting presence. The music is a brilliant bridge between the two as well. Often when Maria is on screen, a new track is introduced. The one thing these songs have in common is they all contain a sort of slinky beat. There's seduction in them, that sort of classic temptation music. When we first meet Maria, Noel Moon plays, and the most notable aspect about it is that seductive beat with the violins playing over it, which is romantic in many ways. Your voice, just your hair and clothes are different. My name is Maria. I don't look like a uh, ghost, do I? See? Feel how warm I am? You're really not Mary. 
I told you, I'm Maria. Then later, Maria takes James to Heaven's Night, a bar that could also double as a strip club. The song Heaven's Night plays in the area, and this is what we'll call Maria's theme, as it contains the same seductive beat and melody we've experienced. It also contains a peculiar synth lead that almost sounds like a church organ. Now, allow me to be a tad bit controversial. I believe Mary's theme is the song Betrayal, the track we hear when James fights Mary at the end of the game. The reason behind that? It acts as a mirror to Heaven's Night. Listening to both tracks, they have an eerie similarity that offers some tantalizing narrative material. That same slinky, seductive beat can be heard in Betrayal. It's just been replaced with the sound of metal. If that isn't enough, the synth lead we mentioned in Heaven's Night has been replaced with a choir in Betrayal, bringing an almost biblical judgment to the track. Maria, the side that James is attracted to, has the more attractive theme song, while Mary's representation of James's guilt and sin and betrayal is filled with danger and righteous anger. Team Silent's attention to detail here is imperative to look into, but thankfully for us, there's so much more to talk about. Is anyone else having goosebumps like I am? Toward the end of the game, after James has realized his true crimes against Mary, he encounters Angela one last time. The song Theme of Laura Reprise is playing, while fire billows around the two characters. Angela reveals her realization that she has searched long enough for her family, and it's time to end what she's endured. This moment, the scene, in my opinion, is one of the most vital scenes in the entire game and truly encapsulates our discussion on music driving character arcs. Mama! Mama, I was looking for you. Now you're the only one left. Maybe then, maybe then I can rest. Mama, why are you running away? <gasps> You're not my mama. Let's take a step back for a moment and please allow me to get emotional and psychological for a bit. We said Theme of Laura was the overall theme for the game's focus on reality. Another way to look at this concept here is that reality is about uncovering the truth. I mean, on a daily basis, most of us make up our own versions of who we are and what we're capable of, often to hide or explain the actions we've made in the past. But then there are the moments where we really see who we are underneath our own and others' ideas, good and bad. An aha moment, if you will. Here, at the end of the game, before our main protagonist's whole story is wrapped up, Angela is our last side character to get her closing arc. Eddie had his moment of truth. Laura, and even Maria in her own way, but now we have Angela. I think that's important, and I think it's even more important that a reprise of the theme of Laura accents the entire scene. See, Angela uses several key phrases that have appeared throughout the game. She asks James if he will save her. She thanks him for saving her. She questions his motives and offers violence as a means to solve a problem. Isn't this exactly what the other characters have made James learn in himself? Mary, Maria, Eddie, and Laura have all taken on one of those questions in his journey. Mary thanks him for saving her. I'll always love you. Maria asks anyway, to be saved. What do you mean, anyway? You don't sound very happy to see me. I was almost killed back there. Why didn't you try to save me? All you care about is that dead wife of yours. I've never been so scared in my whole life couldn't care less about me, could you? No, I just... Then stay with me. Don't ever leave me alone. You're supposed to take care of me. <laughs> Laura questions his motives. You kill her! Why'd you do it? And Eddie proposes Eddie, death and violence as a me. means for rest. I'll kill him! Just like that. 
So we can see thematically and narratively we've compiled together the game's intent. Let's get back to the song with everything wrapped up and why this is all so important. The use of Theme of Lore Reprise is beautiful. Reprises are used to connect an arc previously created in the narrative. However, this is exactly what makes Theme of Lore so important. When do we hear it? Only in the opening cinematic. The abridged tease of what's to come, featuring imagery that we do not understand the context of before we play. But now, we've done it all. We get it. We're emotionally attracted and repulsed. So this reprise, used specifically and delicately here, musically tells us, no, this is it. I never kill myself. I don't know about you, but this has and always will be mind-blowing to me. The intent and care that went into creating this story is fantastic and inspiring. I need to also point out that the final exchange between James and Angela is one of my favorite moments in video game history. It's hot as hell in here. You see it too. For me, it's always like this. There is so much there to unpack in just three lines of dialogue. I can make an entire video about the importance of Angela's character, but that will have to come another day. For now, we're done here. But wait, you're probably thinking, well, what about James? Oh, he gets his own video. In the third and final breakdown of Silent Hill 2, we'll be focusing specifically on James and his music narrative. I'm also extremely excited to share that I'll be having a very special guest, who you'll just have to wait and see who it is. Until then, thank you for watching. Please do me the greatest favor and subscribe, like, and share, and just tell other people. I've been loving hearing others' thoughts on this topic, and we're creating a really cool space to nerd out over video games and their music. Let's make it even better.